ยอดรงไซจอนเนี่ยจิกเตนจาเทจงพยมอชัวจวลินซอตุงเนาะกูยอเรเจอร์วอลิวาซอซีเนี่ยดอดรงเนาะกูจานะมุไซกุนทอต
gathering of the Lao Mung um, uh, Association. Uh, the, uh, there are centers of Hmong population that came here as refugees at the end of the war, those who escaped. Uh, in Cal I think the largest one is in California. Uh, but uh, uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin is probably the next largest concentration of, um, of ethnic Hmong uh, in this country. You first uh, went to Laos. What was your first impression when you see the Hmong people? Well, I was fortunate because my boss was the uh, CIA officer who really discovered the Hmong in the late 50s. I mean, he was known to them as father. I mean, he, he was really something. And uh, so he was able to educate me on the Hmong early on uh, as to their uh, pros and, and cons, uh, weaknesses and strength. I mean, the weakness that, I, that was most apparent with the Hmong was if you moved them out of their, their territory like you would a, a U.S. Army company or battalion, then they're not, not uh, nearly as effective as in their own local area. The north, to keep them in northern Laos so they couldn't be beat. Uh, especially if we gave them air support. Sure. And, uh, and we did, and that was my job, was to provide air support. So my, uh, my boss, uh, Mr. Bill Lair, was the, uh, <clears throat> was the guy who really uh, pioneered uh, the relationship the United States with uh, the Hmong. And that took place well before the Geneva Accords uh, in 62, uh, which threw the Hmong and the other uh, uh, Laotian uh, forces in, into the uh, battle uh, without the U.S. Army. Now, the U.S. Army was there in small numbers before 62, but the 62 Accords supposedly made the country neutral. It's one of the big jokes in history. And uh, under the terms of that accord, the uh, North Vietnamese Army was to pull back to their boundaries, and the U.S. would pull all of its forces out, no uniform forces allowed, and uh, so the hooker there was that uh, the NVA said, yeah, well, we, the North of me signed this and everything was just wonderful, except they didn't pull any troops out. And they continued, in fact, they expanded the area that they uh, occupied, especially in the Panhandle. And they tried to expand it uh, in the north, but General Vang Pao's and, and the Mung opposed them uh, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty stringently, pretty tough. Uh, fighters, as I said, the CIA then came in and provided logistic support and advisory uh, services to the um, to the Hmong and then later others. But the, the CIA never had a lot of people there. That's another misconception of those who knew about it. The CIA, uh, the, the height of the war when I was there, the uh, <coughs> we we had fewer than a hundred case officers in the whole country, north and south. Uh, and, and much of them, most of them were concentrated in the south because that was the area of the so-called Ho Chi Minh Trail and, uh, and the Cambodian uh, situation. Uh, in the north of Laos, we probably had actual paramilitary case officers. We, during, during the time I was there, we probably had less than 10 in the whole, whole place. So we were not doing the fighting for them by any means. We, we provided weapons, we provided uh, financial support, we provided fuel, we provided air support, gradually increasing over time. As, as, the, as the Hmong soldiers got attrited, i.e. killed, uh, we we increased our number of air support sorties per day. So it's a direct relationship there. You know, as they became weaker on the ground, we had to fill in the gaps with air air support. Uh, the uh, <coughs> the uh, air support technically was 
was uh, not envisioned in the Geneva Accords, but they didn't, they weren't specific about it. Uh, so, uh, meanwhile, uh, in the uh, in the battle space, the battle area, <coughs> the North Vietnamese Army kept increasing their strength. They also were providing weapons, money, leadership, advisors to the so-called Path of Lao. The Path of Lao was the communist element in uh, in the armed forces of Laos, but it was a joke. It was when I was there. It was truly a joke. I mean, they 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 could not they couldn't uh, they couldn't handle a, a troop of campfire girls. They uh, they they couldn't fight their way anywhere. Excuse me. They uh, but with the North Vietnamese Army standing behind them, <laughs> you know, they they could be um, uh, very dangerous. And so the uh, Hmong, General Vang Pao, found himself fighting both the, the path of Lao all the time down there and the various areas that they held, like extreme north Laos, uh, Sam Nua, Sing Quang, um, uh, I've forgotten some of the names now. <laughs> it's been a while. In, in that area? Yes. Or the northern yeah. part now. So. And, uh, and then, never if you if you had a path of Lao units, let's say in, in Sam Nua, which which they did, and it's a big transit point, a big hub for tra movement, moving arms and men. Uh, they, they were within shouting distance. You'd find a North Vietnamese Army uh, unit. So, uh, the, uh, so they just gradually, gradually expanded their presence. Uh, but see, the North Vietnamese had a problem because they were fighting us in the south of Vietnam and they didn't like to siphon off manpower or materiel to fight those pesky Hmong because they kept getting in their hair, so to speak, you know. And they'd have to move assets to the north of Laos when they wanted to use them in the south against us. And they were faced with that dilemma all the time and uh, of course we tried to step it up whenever we could uh, to um, to increase the difficulty for the North Vietnamese but because by doing that we were saving American soldiers lives in the end I mean that's hard to envision but that was the end result uh, at least that was our calculus and I believe it was absolutely true it makes common sense so uh, it was it, by the end of the of the 60s. I left there in '69. By the end of the 60s, uh, you, a lot of people thought we were holding our own. We, meaning the, the Lao and and the American allies, but we weren't really because the sand was was running out of this hourglass. Our, our manpower. To be perfectly uh, brutal about it, and without being emotional about it, the uh, our our soldiers were disappearing on us, and you can only fight with 13-year-old boys so <laughs> so long, you know. Uh, they don't have the training, the discipline, the leadership, and so on. But plus, the leadership, Vang Pao's leadership, was was being attrited tr tremendously all along. I mean, his his colonels and majors were dead. And, uh, so it was, so he had, he had a double-barreled problem that Vang Pao was facing. Uh, the, uh, well, at least a double-barreled problem. He was facing a gross shortage of combat leadership and a shortage of soldiers, which was getting less and less, fewer and fewer, Every every month, you know. and uh, that attrition started biting in, in in the mid '60s, about the time Vang Pao was badly wounded in a battle. Um, in the I, I I wasn't there, but I think it was like 1964, and uh, things were going okay at that time. But the, from the time he came back 
from medical uh, uh, rehabilitation, uh, the, the, the steep skid downward had started. Uh, the uh, enemy had started inflicting more and more casualties, and, uh, and we were increasing the air support more and more casualties. <laughs> it, was, it was snowballing. And if you, uh, looking back at it, I, I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back at it, it was clear that, uh, that this, this was a situation that we could not endure much longer, much less Vang Pao endure. You remember Vang Pao was a political and a military leader. Most people just think, well, he was just a military leader. No, he was a political leader, too. And he had to... Uh, uh, keep satisfied the, his constituency, just like any politician has to. Uh, that, that meant the, and this is tribal, right? That meant the elders had to be with him. And uh, they didn't just, they didn't go with him just because he said, you come with me. And he had to consult with them all the time. And uh, even on the battlefield, I've seen uh, elders sitting around uh, fire out on the battlefield with Bang Pao, and, and they uh, he'd, he'd stop tending to military business to deal with them. That was quite an quite an act. I'd never seen anything like that before. Uh, but he was quite effective at it, and he knew his people, and uh, and they and they knew him by this time. Everybody knew him. Uh, they they uh, you know they called him father, but but they met father in the in the real sense. At least that was my observation. And, uh, so, uh, I'm wandering a lot, but the, uh, the uh, Dr. Chava Lee, the president of the Lao Mung uh, coalition, asked me if I'd come here uh, to speak to his people uh, at this annual uh, conclave. And, uh, and I did this afternoon, and uh, I enjoyed it, and enjoyed seeing some of the old faces. And, and uh, you know, I, I just hope that the, the Hmong uh, people here in the United States get themselves a little better unified than I'm told they are now, because although they have a substantial number of people here, you know, it numbers in the, probably a few hundred thousand or something like that, and so they need to be unified politically, in my opinion, uh, as, uh, as well as uh, ethnically. <clears throat> if they want to preserve their heritage, you know, most immigrants to the United States, uh, at least in substantial numbers, uh, manage somehow to pres preserve their heritage, like the Irish and the Italians and, and so on. And uh, I would think that the Hmong would want to do the same thing. They have a lot to be proud of, and uh, you know, it's quite a history. The American people don't know it. When General, when General Van Pao's uh, passed away, how do you feel about at that time? Well, as I recall, that was right after the first of the year in, yes. uh, in uh, <coughs> 2011. Yes. Uh, I didn't ever know any of his children when I was uh, <clears throat> uh, in Laos. I don't recall ever meeting any of them, <clears throat> but then there was no reason why I would. Uh, since that time, I met a couple of his, his uh, offspring, uh, in, including uh, a daughter who's a lawyer in California, uh, and, uh, and, a, and a son and a son-in-law. <clears throat> I think that Vang Pao was never able to effectively coalesce the Hmong here in the United States. It's, it's a, the distances are a lot greater in the first place. The, the, everything is different, you know, so it's, this is not North Laos. This is not going from Long Tien to Nakang to Pu Pati, which you can do just like that. And they're spread out all over. And um, then they're always competing with political drives. I don't care who, what kind of a group you've got. You can, you can be any 
any um, any ethnic group, and uh, you you will find over time uh, maybe they're just splinter groups, but you, you may have a strong group to start with, but over time uh, you'll have some groups uh, going off on a tangent somewhere, or at least perceived tangent. Uh, <clears throat> that's the case with the Hmong today, I think, and uh, it has been since they got to the United States. So they have done a, a great job when you look uh, at, the, at the places I've been where the, where the Hmong are concentrated. They uh, have done a great job in, in uh, assimilating uh, into the American culture. And when you look at the children of the refugees who came here, the, uh, the, you know, the next generation, and now we're into another generation, uh, we've got some pretty high achievers here. Uh, you've got college professors, you've got, uh, needless to say, PhDs, there are PhDs all over the place. You've, you've got medical doctors, uh, you've got lawyers. In fact, Vang Pal's daughter that I mentioned her earlier is a member of the California Bar, you know? And so, uh, I mean, some, something like that was unheard of in Laos. So they've done a, a good job assimilating the American culture, in my opinion. But they have not coalesced politically. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of um, intercourse, uh, but some of it is dissident, and uh, that doesn't help the overall cause of the Hmong, in my opinion. Now go back to Lai Pupati. Can you tell a little bit about Pupati? Uh, Pupati, yeah. Well, Pupati was a... Um, uh, first of all, it had uh, religious connotations uh, in the earlier days uh, of the uh, of the clans in and the tribes in uh, in North Laos. Uh, Pupati is uh, a promontory, uh, a fairly uh, fairly fairly high, uh, higher than most of the surrounding uh, mountain peaks. There, I've forgotten the numbers, but it's you know, six, seven thousand feet, something like that, uh, just to the west or s west southwest of uh, of uh, Sam Nua. And Sam Nua is a town al almost right on the northeast border with uh, Laos and North Vietnam. Uh, at that altitude, with mo with, uh, with modern radar, you can see uh, aircraft very very uh, nicely over Hanoi and so the US Air Force uh, in, uh, in, the, in the 60s was were eyeing that Pupati uh, to help them with their air campaign the first thing they did was uh, put a what, what's known as a TACAN up there this is a radio navigation aid, aid to, aid to navigation gives you range and azimuth. Uh, and that worked out very well and uh, was very, very useful. Uh, the uh, didn't draw any attention from the enemy to, that I know of. Uh, but then in the summer of 67, uh, I was with Bill Air when the commander of Air Force in the Pacific uh, briefed us on uh, a new plan, a bold new plan, which was to put a uh, special radar uh, with, uh, for that time, advanced computer technology, which be, would, would be primitive today, but that time was on the top of that mountain and, uh, and man it around the clock and use it to guide our uh, aircraft in bombing runs uh, in the Hanoi area, so that when weather was bad, it, there would be no let up. They continued hitting, it, and it worked out very well. They, uh, it was quite accurate, more more accurate than I would have expected. And so it became operational in October or so of of '67. But uh, Bill Lair advised everybody from the beginning that uh, we couldn't hold that place for any length of time, but. 
and it was his view that the, the North Vietnamese army would become alerted to it one way or another fairly soon. Uh, once, it, once it started paying off, uh, they'd know. And it was very remote out there, and there were no roads or anything. So, in uh, <coughs> before the first of the year, that year we noted a trace and then a, a road starting. They're building a road from the Sam Nua hub town, right? Was the later later called Route 602, and it went right to the base of the cars that we had the radar on, ultimately. And uh, that was that was the first sign, and then we had other signs and in, uh, in intelligence. Uh, including some reconnaissance, North Vietnamese reconnaissance patrols, which VP knocked off uh, a couple of them and captured some of their documents. And, uh, and one one set of documents I remember is uh, they had a map case, a leather map case. This Vietnamese officer and uh, he had a um, AK-47 hole through it. And they killed this party and. We had the maps down in my uh, office, and they had military-style symbology all over. It was very clear. Uh, it looked like it had been drawn up at the French Military Academy. And it showed where they were going to emplace artillery pieces and mortars and, uh, and various units <laughs> in an assault against Pupati. So we rang alarms and did all. They told us to hold it because it was so useful. ที่จอนิสกิตินจาเทชอพิมาชัวซุนซุตูขอนิโคปาตาลันเดอร์ยอกุนทาโตริชเชสซีคอร์กูยอจงฟื้นอเมริกาอีตุนัยพุนนิต